My dad's life changed when these other men reparented him. That's my word for discipleship. God the Father is reparenting us. No matter how perfect or imperfect or abusive or absent or present our human dads were, we still need to be reparented. There are so many things we didn't learn or our dads didn't teach us. So God is reparenting us, and I saw that in my dad. I don't even know who those men are, but someday in heaven I'm going to meet them and thank them. How long have you been married? We'll start there. Well, I just yesterday celebrated 52 years. 52 is yes, congrats. <laughs> yeah, right. Only 52 years. Yeah, only right. 52. We were nine when we got married. I don't know. No. <laughs> I've interviewed some um, some guests, some sage leaders uh-huh. who have been married maybe over 45. But you maybe have the record for hey, the most right. years Good. married. My wife has the record. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She stayed. <laughs> She's got the record. What's yeah. her first name? Joanne. Joanne. So 52 years, and then yeah. how many kids and how many grandkids? We have two daughters. Uh, they're both married, and uh, we have seven grandchildren and uh, two great-grandchildren. Have, okay. <laughs> so You're talking four, to an old guy. Four here. generations covered right. here. Exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And are yours or your wife's parents uh, in heaven or living they, still? Or? They're all in heaven. Okay, so you've yeah. got four they, generations they right graduated. now here. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 Uh, well, speaking of graduated, I know you've been working on jumping into a next phase of serving in the local church and serving men, and and congrats because it sounds like you've you've stepped out of full time into at least you failed at retirement twice, I think you said. And exactly. Now you're, yeah. now you're stepping into even more men's focus, right? Right. Yes. I I will. I'm available, obviously, for anything that yeah. would fit within my my new rhythm. Yeah. And I'm not calling it retirement. I'm calling it recalibration. That's good. Uh, because I don't want to retire, you know, like go off and play. Sure. But I do want more uh, free time. Mm-hmm. You know, the 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 dirty little secret of pastoring is that you get no weekends. Mm. And so my family's been on a, what I would call a civilian schedule. Sure. They ramp up until Friday, and then they ramp down. Right. Well, I'm ramping up on Friday right. and ramping down on Monday. And so anyway, uh, all that to say, yes, I'm— uh, I'm now moving into a phase where I'm purposely half time yeah. and uh, choosing primarily, obviously, my discipleship focus is men. Mm-hmm. And I'll be teaching men, discipling men, coaching men, and writing to men primarily. Yeah. So, yeah, And as a dad of daughters, you've had this heart for men for so long. Where did that stir up and start? I mean, you've done bike tours with men. You've, you were a youth pastor serving you know, young men. Where did, where did some of the genesis moments of you knowing, hey, I'm, I'm here on earth to serve and lead and disciple men? Well, uh, you know, let me, let me tell you a story. Okay. Um, I've told this story many, many times. Uh, I think it really comes from my dad. Uh, my dad was born into a home uh, in Seaside, Oregon, and uh, became a Christ follower when he was about 13 in a little Baptist church there. But he was never really discipled. And his dad was abusive, angry, alcoholic, hard worker, immigrant Norwegian guy, worked in the sawmills. He was a team street. He, he literally drove horses in the forest, dragging logs to the sawmills. And so he's a provider for his home, but he wasn't a dad. He wasn't present. But my dad's mom was a very sort of, um, I would she would probably be called a Pentecostal or charismatic yeah. today, yeah, but sure. she just prayed and prayed and prayed mm-hmm. most of the time in Norwegian for her boys. And so anyway, my dad became a Christ follower at a young age, but he wasn't discipled. So he joined the army when he was 20, 21. It was 1941 just before he was going to get drafted anyway. Yeah. He was very mechanical, and so he became a tank maintenance battalion, uh, a, a maintenance mechanic. Oh. Joined a tank maintenance battalion in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is where they practice all that. Well, that battalion was infiltrated by Christ followers. Yes. Uh, there were a bunch of guys there. They were actually Plymouth Brethren, okay. and Plymouth Brethren uh, don't have paid clergy which is a bad idea, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, pay your but, pastors. But they believed in training their men in Scripture. Mm-hmm. Well, these guys uh, got a hold of my dad. They just lit him up. The Lord lit him up. They taught him how to share his testimony. They solidified his faith. They taught him how to read the Bible, how to pray, how to sing in a quartet. And they got together, and one of the men was an officer. He was a Lutheran pastor for, or a Lutheran officer from Minnesota. And... Uh, 
they got together, and this officer had his wife there, and her name was Margaret. And one night, one night my dad said to Margaret, who's this re- very vivacious gal, he said, it's too bad you don't have a sister. And she said, oh, but I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> She's back in Brooklyn, New York. So my dad began to write to my mom, my future mom, uh, as a nurse in Brooklyn, New York. So they're bi-coastal. One's from Seaside, Oregon. One's from Brooklyn, New York. And never met. They never met. Writing. And they, they wrote, they ke- became daily correspondence. So I say that my parents met on the internet, you know, the slow internet. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, and they married after the war. But, but all this to say, um, my dad's life changed when these other men reparented him. That's my word for discipleship. Wow. God the Father is reparenting us. No matter how perfect or imperfect or abusive or absent or present our, per, our, our human dads were, we still need to be reparented. We, there are so many things we didn't learn or our dads didn't teach us. So God is reparenting us. And I saw that in my dad. He I don't even know who those men are, but someday in heaven I'm going to meet them and yeah, thank them. Yes. They, they taught him how to do all these things to, to feed himself spiritually. They, they lit him up. He later became a pastor. I grew up in, a, in, a, in his home as a pastor. And, and uh, they also, but they also showed him how to treat a woman. They showed him how to be a gentle, strong man. And so, uh, Jeff, I'm an inheritor of that. Yes. I'm, I'm a complete recipient of a man who, with whom God broke the chain. You know, so my dad's a first generation chain breaker, yes. like a New Testament disciple. And and look at what that has done. I mean, don't look at me, but just look at the what I got as a gift. I, I got a dad who who loved me, who cared for me, and I got also his group of other men. For some reason he was he was a my dad was a hero maker. He was always saying uh, I grew up in Golden, Colorado. It's a Colorado School of Mines was there, and we had a couple of professors in our church. And my dad would say, "You know that guy? He is brilliant." And he'd say, "You know, Ken, he's the best plumber in the state." You know, he'd call it out. You know, he'd say, "Look at the craftsmanship of how that guy built that wall." You know, mm-hmm. so my dad was always pointing to the the capacities of men and admiring those men, and he had and he related to those men. So I think it kind of came in my DNA. Mm-hmm that I've just been drawn to and fascinated by the different giftings and capabilities of men. And uh, so that has, that's kind of been in my, my blood. And obviously, I'm not going to be discipling women. Right, right. But it's not like this was a second choice for me. It was a natural. And then as I grew in ministry, I, I uh, spent a couple of summers um, with a ministry called Sea and Summit okay. out of Santa Barbara, California, and we took delinquent boys on 21-day expeditions to the high Sierras and uh, mountain climbing and stuff like that. And, um, and obviously, I, so I was put in charge of a watch. We called it a watch of four other guys. And we spent three whole weeks together. And, uh, and I really learned a lot of skills there. I learned a lot of um, – it, it kind of tweaked my adventure side. Yeah. You know, I'm not a wild adventurer, but I've always had a, a hunger to see what's over the horizon. Yeah. I still do. I want to, when I ride, I don't want a GPS. I want to find out what's over the hill. You do. <laughs> you know, now I'm over the yes. hill. But, you no, know, you're not. I, I you're not, find Roger. out what's out there. So, wow. you know, I don't even remember what your question was, but, but I focus on men, mm-hmm. uh, not because it's my duty. It's just really been a, a joy. And when I come home from teaching men... Uh, my wife always remarks. She says, "You just look alive." Yes, it's just my sweet spot, and and I know that's not true for every pastor. It's not true for every Bible teacher, um, but it is for me. And part of that's the it's the brotherhood. Mm-hmm. You know, I I feel like um, I've gained. I, I didn't have. I had two sisters, and now I have two daughters. So I I grew up. Mm-hmm. In, in sororities. That's right. <laughs> I know a lot about that. Yeah, that's my right. four daughters. Yeah. So hmm. so I felt like I've gained brothers you yes. know, in this process, and uh, God has blessed me. I, I You know, frequently I I get involved with families, like especially in a, a funeral situation, mm-hmm. and sometimes I'll be involved with a family, and there's not 
one trustworthy, articulate man in the family who could be the executor of the will or who will care for the family in this time and just organize them and take care of things, you know, clean out the house or do whatever. And I just think about, man, I could give me three minutes. I could name 50 guys who would do that. Could carry that for me. And I'm not their family. You know, some would be better at it, at it than others, but sure. I just feel so wealthy, wow. you know, in this whole process. So. Well, Roger, I, I want to point out a few things yeah. that you said. I mean, the first is that by pouring out, you feel wealthy, like mm-hmm. that you feel by investing yeah. In yep. young men, in, in men in various, because you get mm-hmm. multi-generational, like you're just like focused on whether it's yeah. the teenager, the young dad, mm-hmm. the grandpa. Um, but the other thing you said about your dad is that he was a hero maker with his words, yeah. mm-hmm. not just his thoughts. We can think well about people, yeah. but when we put it, when we articulate for others, you were listening, you were yeah. watching. Mm-hmm. Um, did he use his words for you in that way of calling things out in you as well? Or do you see that more that he called it out in, in others? You know, he, I don't know that, I don't recall uh, a lot of, specific words for that, but there was a lot of what I would call a healthy expectancy. Okay. Like, um, I got a paper out when I was 11, and my dad said, well, you know, you can do this, but this is your route. Yeah. We, I, I can't do this for you. Are you ready for this responsibility? And I felt like I was being addressed as a man. Yeah, at 11. In fact, you know... I don't. I look back on it now. We basically lived at the poverty level. I mean, you know, we were, we never starved. But I remember my mom coming to me and saying, you know, when I'm 11, she said, "Do you do you think you could buy a pair of boots for yourself this year? Could you buy your winter coat?" Yeah. And I didn't feel imposed. I to me, maybe I'm weird, but to me, you're empowered. That empowered mm-hmm. me. I felt like. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. proud to do that, you know? I'm yeah. making a dollar a day, yeah. 100 papers, yeah, that's <laughs> $30 a month, yep. and saving mm. and tithing and all that. Anyway, that's getting off the track. But but yeah, my dad used his words for me um, mostly, and his affirmation was mostly, um, we can do this together. Mm-hmm. And I was impatient. I was in a hurry, and he was always very patient. We did a lot of car work and a lot of stuff and I was always getting mad and throwing wrenches and he's saying, Roger, somebody else put this together, we can put it together. Yeah. You know, it's and then later as yeah. I got older and went to college and was doing more moving away, he wrote me letters, you know, to affirm how proud he was of me, how Mayor. much he loved me. Mm. And there was never any doubt of that. He was never really a very physical guy in terms of hugging. Hugs. Yeah. But I, I share the story that um when I was in high school, I bought a 1960 Studebaker Lark. Okay. I don't Some know. of your guys I don't out know what there, that is. you don't <laughs> even know what that is. Well, basically, it was the junkiest car you could okay, buy, okay. the cheapest. And I blew the transmission out of it right away. So my dad said, well, let's put a stick shift in there. So we went to the junkyard and got an old transmission, mm-hmm. a transmission with an overdrive, which weighs, you know, a lot more than a normal. And these are all cast iron beasts, you know. So we're underneath this thing, and we're trying to get the pilot bearing hooked up and the drive shaft hooked up and and we're laying there trying to get it hooked up and get one bolt started so we can relax yes, you, don't you hold know it. and i just remember the physical proximity mm-hmm. of shoulder to shoulder with my dad under this greasy car like and, your life depends on it you yeah, have to hold that yeah <laughs> and and just the fact that you know we weren't hugging each other mm-hmm. but this was there's this manliness Bond. of teamwork you know football players feel that yeah. wrestlers feel that athletes feel that you know there's it, it's not it's not a it's not at all a sexual thing. It's a, it's it's a manly thing. And then sitting on the mm-hmm. step, shoulder yeah. to shoulder with a cup of coffee afterwards. Yeah, that's how, I think manly affection was conveyed to me. Yeah. That I'm with you. I'm mm-hmm. we're in this together. I need you for this, and I certainly needed him. But he made it clear that he needed me. So, mm. you know, m- my dad. Um, I can't remember one time when my dad said, hey, uh, I'm going to take a Saturday off. Let's do whatever you want to do. Didn't do that. He never said that. He yeah. said, I'm taking a Saturday off. We're going to go over and help Bud take the transmission out of his car. Let's go. Yeah. He included me in his world. So good. And I don't know if every kid would respond to that the way I did. To me, that was like, Loved it. I can't wait. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm going to get up early you mm. know, as I get to be with my dad. 
So, so, so practical and yeah. so different. Uh, often, like I don't think of that as being a gift to my little girls, but it can be yeah. if if they're pulled in. Yeah. Um, the the other thing you mentioned is your dad's group of friends that led to that trajectory changing kingdom mm. focus, working on tanks, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> like just so we could remember as men that that when we come around someone or when we welcome someone into our group of friends, or whether it's mm-hmm. that that softball league, or it's that uh, you know group that's already doing something, we welcome somebody else in and we lead them to Jesus. Like you now have three, gen- you know, you're looking right. at four generations, including yourself, and you're saying back, like, I can't wait to meet those men in heaven. Exactly. I just want to make sure none of us miss that. Like the, the deposits we make um, in brotherhood could have such further lasting. I mean, you've now given three, four decades to men, like the amount of men who have been touched from you. And it was directly a, a, a trickle down of yeah. those men around those tanks. Yeah. Working on tanks. Yeah. And it was never, they had, yeah, they had no idea. And no, my dad clearly. really didn't have any yeah. intentions to, about what I would do. Yeah. Um, but Lord willing, he'll see it one day. He will. He yeah. will. Um, yeah. I did want to talk about the difference between endurance and perseverance. And maybe as a little setup for the guys who don't know who Ernest Shackleton is. I, I've read <laughs> the, um, I think it's called The Endurance, the, his book. Yes, Endurance, yeah. Uh, and just a little setup to that story. But then the difference, uh, you know, dad life, um, the the let's see. So I just to make sure I have this right. There's perseverance and endurance. Perseverance means you actually have a specific thing that you can persevere to, a dead an end, end, right? And endurance is the ongoing, you don't know how long. Am, yeah. I, am I right on that? Well, that would be my definition. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I, I've, I've written a book called Do the Next Right Thing, and it talks about adding to your faith, goodness into goodness, virtue uh, to goodness, fa- um, faithfulness into faithfulness, endurance, et cetera. Yeah. And um, I, I really believe that uh, there is a difference between endurance and perseverance that we we can't prove it semantically mm-hmm. but we can prove it in our lives yeah. so like endurance is like running the mile mm-hmm. so whenever i ran the mile i knew the hardest lap of the mile is the third lap yeah. it's when the adrenaline is gone and you're 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 starving for oxygen but you got to keep going but you know if you get through the third lap there's only one more one so you left. can kick it in yep it's not a pleasant feeling, but you you can get there, and then you hit the finish line. But perseverance is a different kind of sustaining energy. Mm-hmm. It's when you're running and you find out, you know what? I think think I took a wrong turn, and I'm not sure where I am. I got to keep running till I get back. In fact, this happened to me one time in Copenhagen. Okay. <laughs> I won't explain the whole story, but I, I was going to go for a six-mile run, turned into be about a 12 or 13-mile run because I Oops. turned the wrong direction and I got all turned. I didn't have a phone number. I was backwards, lost in the city. I had to keep running until I found my way back. But perseverance is like having a special needs child. Mm. Mm. You You have to keep running. You have to keep pouring in and you don't know if it will ever end. Yeah. You don't you don't know where the finish line is or you may be caring for a wife who has a health issue and you don't like the ending that you see coming. Mm-hmm. But you still need to love and serve this woman. Yeah. You have a, a a business that your technology is old, it's phasing out, you know that, you know, sooner or later you're going to have to close up this shop or there's not enough business coming your way, but you can't just walk away. You have to show up every day in all the discouragements. And But God calls us to that kind of perseverance. And I just, I see so many men around me who have modeled that for me. Mm. You know, not enough, but many have modeled that for me where... I, I don't know how they do it, except by the grace of God. And we just need to remember that perseverance is one of the virtues. It's one of the graces of God. Mm. And sooner or later, we're all going to face it. Yeah, I'm going to face it. Where my physical capabilities are taken away, mm. where I can't do the adventures I want to do. And the question will be, okay, Lord, with just your presence, just your grace in my life, just your, your voice, I want to... I want to persevere. Yeah. So. And preparing for being ready to to carry strength into perseverance. Um, 
uh, like yeah. challenging ourselves when we don't have to. Right. So this would tie in with doing this hundred mile bike ride that we did yeah. together last right. year and, and, uh, you know, other challenges. I mean, even those 21 day adventures that you took these, yeah. these young, young adult men on, um, or they were teenagers, I think, right? Those adventures. Right. Yeah. yeah most of them were. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, how would you like you, and maybe, maybe this quote will actually be helpful from your book and we'll link your book, do the next right thing in the show yeah. notes, but you wrote this Warning, the road to spiritual ineffectiveness and unproductiveness goes right through the Doritos aisle. That was your quote, right? <laughs> yeah, Am I right? So, yeah, right. <laughs> so so the, uh, the idea of comfort is the draw, the gravitational pull is going to be towards yes. comfort, doing yeah. easy things. Yeah. We chose to ride 100 miles to help the yeah. fatherless for yeah. the fathers for the fatherless. Um, how would you encourage us to prepare for being men who can, can have perseverance? Well, I think we have to be careful that that we don't become ascetic. You know, that word to be an ascetic person is a person who thinks if I punish myself, if I wear a hair shirt, if I mm. sleep without a blanket, you know, like the old monks, if I mm. somehow become this this body denying, pleasure denying person, that somehow I'll be closer to God. Right. We have to be careful about that. Yeah. Nevertheless, we are in such a huge Doritos aisle yeah. of, of pleasures and snacks, spiritual snacks, that I do think we need to search for things where we say, you know what, I'm going to withhold my reward mm -hmm. for a while. Yeah. I, I'm going to put myself in situations that make me uncomfortable. They might be physical, but it might be, <clears throat> might be spiritual. You know, maybe I'll... I'll, I'll teach third grade boys, mm. <laughs> you yeah. know, put myself in a place where I need to step up, be faithful, make a commitment and endure in that. I think the road to, to true perseverance is through endurance mm -hmm. saying, you know, I can, maybe it's even just, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to fix this part of my house, even though I don't know how to do it, mm. but I'm going to endure through the process I'm going to face the failure. I'm going to go to Home Depot 12 times. <laughs> yep. But but I'm going to get out of the comfort boat and and into the raft where it, it's a little bit more stark. I'm exposed a little bit more. And mm -hmm. um, again, we can that can become crazy. We're not talking about um, being t d deniers of all pleasure. But the Scripture says in James that that all of these trials, which we don't normally have to even go looking for those, they're built to build endurance in us, but endurance must complete its work, which nice. is to bring us to joy. Yeah. The joy of the Lord. Wow. So that's so, the direction we're so headed. So endurance is not the goal. Perseverance is not the goal, but it's a means. And and you know, you've, you've experienced it in your own life or you've experienced it with people mm. who go through deep trials that they didn't choose. And they say, you know what? I never would have chosen that, but I would, I would never have... I don't want to miss the opportunity. I was never closer to the Lord. I actually miss the times of struggle. Because it's marked me. It's, it's marked, marked me. And, and I, I've gotten, a lot of people say, I've gotten lazy, you know, since then, you know? Wow. And so anyway, I want to take us important. forward in another direction. Yeah. Let's pause just a yeah. second longer in this topic with the word fortitude. Fortitude. Yeah. Don't hear many people talk about um, that, that term. Um, and you spent 40 days talking about that with, with men that you lead. And you also spent 40 days on wisdom and integrity. And there's at least two or three others. And they'll all be linked in the show notes, These this YouTube channel full of mm -hmm. bite-sized, two-minute, right? Two-minute short. Well, three Just, to four. Uh, sometimes you got passionate. <laughs> yeah, right. You got a little fat, passionate. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, so fortitude, what, yeah. what is it and why is it uh, valuable and important for us men? Well, fortitude, that word came out of a study we were doing in, uh, out of the life of Joshua. Joshua, yep. Yeah. You know, and so fortitude is the courage to step up even when you're afraid. And uh, it's really another word for courage, mm -hmm. but it's kind of courage in action. And you recall the story of, of Joshua was, is it three times in the first chapter? God yep. says, you know, don't be afraid, yep. take courage, step up, you know, be a man of fortitude. So um, I need it every day. Mm -hmm. There's something that comes along every day that's threatening or I don't want to do it. And mm -hmm. fortitude is that manly, um, active courage that says, hey, boys, we're going in, Yeah, you know, 
we're going in. Yeah, so good. You mentioned rock climbing earlier, right. and you referred to Peter as a rock climbing coach. I think at some right. point I heard you refer right. to that. And yeah. this is again in your book. Do the next. Do the next right thing. First Peter. One, three through nine. I'll hit them fast. And I'm, Second Peter. Oh, I hit it wrong. Second Peter. Thank yeah, you for the Peter. catch. Yeah. That was a test to make sure, Roger. That you're <laughs> yeah, gonna... I think I remember. Uh, so it says, uh, so these are the eight. Faith, yeah. goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. Did I get the eight right? Yep. Okay. Right. My, my scribbling handwriting. Uh, without going into one of them at depth, just the flyover, why did you choose these handholds? Um, and why is this so important for, for men? Well, uh, <laughs> I chose them because that's what Peter said. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Peter, Peter is coming at the end. Peter's near the end of his life, okay. and Jesus told him how he's going to die. He's going to die not by his own choice, but somebody's going to lead him where he doesn't want to go. And yet Peter is saying to the church, the living church that's scattered all over the, the, the Eastern culture there, He's saying, these are the things that you need to add to your faith, not like a ladder that you climb toward elitism, but these are like the handholds that a climber would use. Sometimes you need an overhand grip. Sometimes you need a jam. Sometimes you need an underhand grip. Good. Sometimes it's a friction grip. You never know when you're going to need this. So master these eight handholds because you're going to need them. And sometimes you're going to use one constantly, mm. you know, like we just talked about perseverance. Well, I'm yeah. still hanging on. Yeah. So Peter, I, I use the analogy of climbing because I didn't want it to become a stairway to spirituality. Yeah, to like, rival. hey Jeff, I'm on I'm on seven. Mm. Where are you? Yeah. You know, no, that's not it. At any given point, mm. you know, my faith is going to require self control, or it's going to require godliness, yeah. uh, or one of these other handholds. So, so I, I've I I just love the the compressed mm. clarity of Peter saying at the end of his life, basically, obviously by the Holy Spirit's inspiration, but his own journey, this is what I've learned. I want yeah. to pass this on to you. This yeah. is what you need. And, and he says, I'm going to keep reminding you of these mm. things in that same chapter. 